Good morning and welcome back to Scale Up Impact Summit Day 2. Uh, I'm Walter Jennings and this morning we're going to dive into ESG meets Web3 uh, and elevating the positive impact of new in, of the new internet. Uh, we're joined today by Evan Aoyang, who's group president of Animoca Brands. Um, Evan is someone who's very familiar to uh, repeat attendees at Scale Up Impact Summit. Um, and it was great seeing his colleague Yatsui yesterday um, on stage. Uh, Animoca is a multinational blockchain and investment company. Uh, and Evan is their group president. Uh, Evan, great to see you again. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me again, Walter. And always good to have you as my host. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, Evan, we're talking about um, ESG meets Web3. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar, ESG is, I guess, CSR on steroids or corporate social responsibility. And it is environment, social and governance. Now, how do these how does ESG play a big role in shaping Animoca brands and your business strategy. Let's start at the higher level, and then we'll dive into each of the the, the areas. Yeah, so sure. I mean, you know, uh, great that you've spoken to Yat uh, at the beginning. So, so you know, you might have heard uh, all the audience might have heard from him about the purpose of the company and why we're doing this. So, we're not. Uh, I suppose uh, you know we are not. Uh, you know you know, early 20 year old coming out of garage, you know, so we, we do want to do this for purpose, right? I mean, at this, at, 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 at sort of our, um, more, I guess, uh, you know, a little bit more advanced in our career, we really want to do this so that we can make a difference in the world, right? So the purpose of it really matters a lot. So the, the way we look at it, uh, from the, uh, from the perspective of, uh, uh, what we're doing is that we're trying to help the third iteration of the internet, right? We know that, you know, the power of creation that has happened in, in, in its truest form is always about open collaboration, which is what happened in Web3. It sort of didn't really happen in Web2 as the data uh, that are being mined incessantly uh, has led to the growth of platforms and therefore your know, privacy issues and all that. In, uh, in Web3 space uh, under blockchain, we feel that there's a big, um, potential here to re-democratize internet so that the creators uh, can uh, recapture the power that uh, that they uh, that they have further along uh, economies and the internet to begin with right so youtubers or the influencers or even musicians or creators or teachers or the like uh, can really um, uh, capture uh, the value of their own creation rather than sort of captured by platform so we focus a lot on um, uh, creating community, right? So uh, we don't think of ourselves as sort of like, well, let's like create all of these assets that we have 300 or so each um, uh, of our investing company so that we can dominate the space, right? Which some media are saying that should we be afraid of any mocha. I say, we're not at all doing that. We're trying to, uh, you know, write checks or, you know, help directly with management so that we can actually help the growth of ecosystem for the benefit of the community uh, as a whole, so that it benefits the social part of it. And by the way, with the innovation, I'm, I'm sure we're getting to each of the topics, we can then evolve uh, the social value from it and then uh, evolve governance from it as you decentralize. So we are really looking for a better way of uh, running and governing virtual economies and therefore allowing um, uh, the participants to first and foremost benefit from it and the facilitators are meant to get a slice of it, but not dominate it, so that it uh, captures what we'll call unreasonable rents. Evan, you've got uh, you had mentioned some three hundred plus investment companies, and clearly the power of Animoca is to give them a bigger platform, but also to provide them teachings about best practice and different ways of approaching business. How is ESG thought of when you're looking at? improving the performance of your portfolio companies or helping them uh, ramp up the good they can do. So, so the, by the way, when you talk about, you know, ESG, the S part sometimes gets sort of being squeezed in the middle. <laughs> it's a part that doesn't get talked about a lot. And, 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 and that part so really folks are, are sure the S stands for so, social or society. Um, so yes, definitely the S does get a bit squeezed. 
That, that's right, a squeeze in the middle. So, so, so the S part really, you know, by its own, or, or you can say Evans' interpretation of S is really about the social consciousness of that particular company being in the space is it conscious of its role in the community that it serves, right? Does it overall benefit the community by its existence or does it extract from the community more so than it contributes, right? So you could actually think about industries or companies that are by primarily extractive in the sense that it actually, uh, you know, captures the rent, but doesn't create a lot of value of it, right? So, you know, you could name a lot of examples. I want to name those examples right now, but the the, the very presence of the, of the, of, of any mocha, uh, our purpose itself is really about the the S being in the middle being really one of the most core pillars of the ESG of it. So uh, when we look for companies, uh, we are very much about our founders and the team aware of its role uh, in the space in which it intends to operate, or that it will and uh, it, it will it will it will operate in right. So, uh, meaning that which space are you in? Are you in the uh, infrastructure space? If you're in the infrastructure space uh, on on the chain, what space are you occupying? What are you contributing to it? Is that valuable? Of course, we're asked practical questions such as like, is the team talented enough? Is the product good enough? Uh, are you going to have the potential to be like number one or number two player in this particular space, at least in the space that you uh, intend to operate in? But at the same time, it's kind of, are you mission aligned, right? So this is one thing that we talked about a lot. Uh, and by the way, uh, when we hire people, we talk about mission alignment as well. We, we, we have a lot of, we're fortunate enough to have a lot of smart people who might want to join us, but are we here to sort of extract? Are we here to really think about contribution? So even sort of from, from sort of founder level to sort of like, you know, hiring people to corporate values, you know, two of the, the corporate values of mission alignment is that, are you socially minded, right, as a leader? I will say that in our executive committee, everyone is socially minded in the sense that, you know, when we make an investment or when we you know, create something or we try to facilitate or grow something, is this net net good, right? Is this is this player net net good, right? And also, we're also very humble, right? In, in, in spite of the fact that, you know, we might be one of the, the, the companies that in the space are more prominent in the space. We're also very humble in trying to learn, are we making, you know, are we, are we, are we thinking through these correctly? Are we really making a difference? So, so it really is a front and center of, of what, is, what is it that we do. It's that, it's that part about thinking about how we contributing the overall development of Web3. Otherwise, you know, honestly, you know, maybe the, the, the 300 or so investments uh, can be um, can be uh, 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 more more focused into, shall we say, why don't we make certain chains win, right? Why don't we make certain wallets, you know, uh, win? Why don't we make certain gaming uh, companies win? Why do we even uh, uh, invest in the multiple uh, companies in the same space, right? It is because we want to see innovation and competition to further develop the space. So it's a very different thing that we do. Uh, it's not tra tra traditional VC, nor do we see ourselves as a VC. We see ourselves as ecosystem builder. You know, Evan, um, while we stick on the S for a minute, um, obviously within your portfolio companies, you've seen serious transformation of the creative industry. You know, Web3 allows the, the designer or the artist to generate content and then uh, benefit from that uh, sale or, or use of that. Um, tell us about your... Uh, the, the transformations that you've seen in the creative industry, and then also at that user level with that user-generated content and the way people are now pay, uh, playing to pay <laughs> um, and, and you know, transforming the, um, the, the, the ownership model. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. I, I, I'll answer that by first stepping back about, you know, what is it that we really do see as value? I'm, I don't know if he had gone through it, but he's, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about is, is data being the core value of the internet. So it doesn't really, shouldn't really belong to platforms. It really belongs to each of us. And, and as we see that our children or the teenagers or the rising 20s, people entering the workforce are increasingly uh, spending time uh, in, uh, in the internet, um, powering uh, their time via blockchain technology is a lot better than powering it through platforms because the, then the data belongs to us, right? We spend time over internet, uh, we create lots of data and time is valuable, right? So 
ultimately, you know, there there are really, you know, a couple of things that are really different about the the Web three version of the of the metaverse. One being the platform we belong to everyone, uh, being it being tradable. You know, you have true ownership. Uh, you have true composability once you have that, and then you can have interoperability of assets, right? So, so ultimately, if you think about that belonging to creators, uh, how, how powerful uh, could that possibly be in terms of some of the industries that have been uh, dominated by distribution channels? Um, now, we're not saying that, you know, it's all sort of like, you know, um, uh, uh, shall we say that it's, uh, we have now a pathway towards uh uh, a, a huge disruption, but we're saying that there are definitely uh, green shoots as to how we could start to make things for the better, right? So, mm -hmm. for example, right, and we 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 do uh, walk the talk a little bit. Um, we are invested in the music uh, industry ourselves, right? And and that particular industry is really complicated in terms of IP rights, the layers of, of IP rights. You have the lyrics, you know, the, the, the music itself, you know, and then distribution rights and, and all that, right? So, so um, uh, you have seen musicians, you have seen artists being frustrated with respect to, you know, being discovered and then sort of year after year feeling that they are, you know, at the, at the, at the, at the whims of, of, uh, of the contract they have signed. Uh, you know, of course, discovery has costs as well, but, you know, what Web3 allows you to do is more organic discovery, given that the uh, distribution is no longer what, like what it was before when I guess, uh, when, well, I guess I was young, we only watched TV, right? And there are like a couple of channels. Now, you know, uh, people um, like uh, children, or not, hopefully not children, children, but, you know, younger people watch more organic things, right? Of what, adults, right, you know, or, or the, or the uh, boomer generation or even uh, the Gen X generation would consider to be low quality, right? But, but it's, it's stuff that are very organic, very genuine, very authentic. That really, like, that makes the creators really authentic and actually makes a lot of money, like right? Mr. Beast and, 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 you know, lot, lots of examples that we can make, right? Now, at the end of the day, with that kind of um, uh, organic discovery, should the power belong to the channels or the power should go to the creator? We believe ultimately it should, it should go to the creators. Now, so music is one of them, uh, uh, creation uh, and, and, and their side of it. And then, and then uh, one thing that we've gotten into is, is education as well, which uh, which is the tiny tap acquisition that we that we have made, um, which is about education curriculum. Now, we believe, and by the way, this goes to the very first time I met uh, Yat at a, at a dinner at his home, uh, where we talked about education, how, you know, in, in fact, that uh, system hasn't really evolved that much, uh, and, and how teachers are actually some of the most valuable uh, human beings or professions in the world, where in most places in the world, they're not actually compensated uh, correctly, shall we say, for the value that they create. It created people who are successful, you know, uh, you know, such as yourself, maybe myself, very lucky to have gone through very good education. And by tokenizing curriculums, by empowering that creativity, you're creating and enabling a class of creators to come out to dedicate themselves to education and creation mm -hmm. to innovative curriculums that is tested in the market, then that becomes an asset that, uh, that, uh, then, then can, that can then be uh, beneficial to both the holders and, um, and, and, and to the teachers who are the creators themselves. And maybe you're able to attract different kinds of talent uh, yeah. to innovate uh, alongside of, uh, you know, uh, early and higher education, right? So um, uh, there are many more that I can talk about. It's a great industry, though, when school. you talk about uh, education, because, you know, the development of curriculum uh, is uh, time consuming. I've, I've run, you know, three day courses on creative thinking. And, and once you develop that curriculum, you know, you have to run that course. It's, uh, you know, it's over, but uh, your ability then to link ongoing monetary rewards to the curriculum creators is a great way to enhance the profession of teaching. Evan, I want to shift to the E of ESG, which is environment. And, and certainly when people think about Web3, they think about um, earlier stories of Ethereum electricity usage and power and is this green and responsible. So how do you think about the E in ESG in Web3 at Anamoka? 
So um, uh, the E part uh, on, on blockchain is a, is a part that actually gets criticized the most, right? Even mm -hmm. though this is the, the new space that should have that consciousness, because ultimately it is about, you know, uh, uh, consumption of resources in a sustainable manner, right? So proof of work is, uh, is, uh, is, is very good from a perspective of, uh, of security and decentralization, right? As you can see with Bitcoin Ethereum, it's not as good with speed. We'll talk about the blockchain trilemma a little bit here. And uh, if you look at the overall energy consumption, Bitcoin still takes on lion's share and then followed by ETH because they're both proof of work and they're also the largest blockchains, right? Now, um, ultimately, um, the programmable layer and the uh, sort of the, uh, shall we say, the, the growth of the ecosystem in Web3 right now is driven by Ethereum uh, or uh, programmable parts of it. It's not just Ethereum, people will debate with me on that one, but the programmable aspect of it rather than block, uh, rather than Bitcoin is what is capturing the attention of the whole market right now, right? And Ethereum itself, uh, understanding that it's not expensive, maybe slow, is moving itself to proof of stake, which would really uh, reduce its electricity consumption. Uh, both from a sustainable perspective and also from a from a, from a from perspective of actually being lower cost, because again, you know, competing for algorithmic to solve algorithmic puzzles by you know massive uh, computers or not massive computers, basically you know very powerful graphic cards is going to be very very uh, uh, energy uh, consuming, right? So ultimately, um, uh, the movement from proof of work to other kinds of proof of stake or proof of authority, proof of whatever else, right? And layer two is, is really looking to make uh, these economies, economies more efficient. So I generally see that the environmental side of that of blockchains will evolve into more sustainable ways just because the number of transactions and the number of wallets will grow. Again, we only have 80 million wallets right now. Uh, out of a population of about 5 billion internet users, there's a lot more penetration to be had and there'll be a lot more blockchains that will come, come about and a lot of communities built. And the only way to go about this is a better uh, energy efficiency. That's the organic piece of it. But the other side of it is the application side of it, right? Uh, and I, I do believe that ultimately the, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, blockchains or uh, virtual economies have a role to play in this because uh, uh, Web3, there have been a lot of innovations and we've, we've been looking into it um, in terms of uh, uh, sort of can Web3 facilitate, uh, let's say, uh, globalized carbon trading, which uh, is right now very local markets, right? Local, you know, certifications, uh, sort of like, you know, what, what's, what qualifies for an offset and all that. It's, it's sort of like very much in the, it's not even Web2 world, it's kind of like in, in a bit of an old world. But a, a ton of carbon is a ton of carbon is good for the planet and should be uh, unfroze in the way that is, it makes it global. Uh, there are certain innovations in that that allows tokenization of, uh, uh, of uh, carbon assets that can, be, that, that can facilitate better trading. And therefore, I can see that there's a lot better uh, mechanism, there are DAO mechanisms that can actually solve this problem. That's another one. Uh, there are more creative um, companies doing uh, different things, such as, let's, let's say, MetaCarbon, a company that Animoca has invested into uh, that has basically created carbon creatures. Uh, if you mint it, there'll be automatic offsets uh, in, uh, because it's tied to projects that are, that are VERA certified and it automatically decarbonizes um, uh, uh, the forest, right? So again, so you know, this stuff the, is super fascinating. You're rewarding the user with um, improvements for the planet. So um, you're gamifying uh, carbon credits. So that's an that's interesting right. approach. Right. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. so... Yeah, no, the, uh, the, the growth of carbon credits and trading of uh, carbon exchanges on global um, blockchain uh, uh, systems is certainly a growth area. Um, and uh, I, I'm interested watching the, the growth of that market. Um, the G in ESG stands for governance. Uh, and I do know Web3 certainly allows some unique structures. Um, I served a temporary role as the CMO of a metaverse on a DAO. Um, and uh, tell us uh, tell us about DAO and the growth of the uh, unique corporate governance uh, approach to running companies. Yeah, so I, I guess the governance approach is really the, um, being the ESG being the, the last one here could actually be a holy grail of all this. The beginning 
might actually be asked about the, the social construct of full benefits is really the, the essence of Web3. We then come back to the S, make it more sustainable so that the whole thing works. And then G is really the holy ground. At least that's the way my, my I personally see it because um, are, are we are we happy with uh, uh, governance systems around the world? Do we see breakdowns? Do we even see uh, some degree of fracture in democratic institutions? Maybe you know we are off debates about that, right? But but G is a more um, uh, for Web three is really about having exploring a more democratic approach to the internet, right? So ultimately, the blockchain creates uh, transparency. Uh, and DAOs create better uh, governance, hopefully, because you are essentially uh, creating communities that are um, that are amalgamated only by the interests of that particular project or mission, um, where everything, including your votes, your voice, uh, although um, uh, you don't have to reveal your true real world, real world identity, you really truly have um, uh, power, right, in your voice. Right. And uh, uh, it, by the way, in terms of uh, level setting uh, or uh, shall we say um, making it truly global, uh, uh, sort of like uh, leveling the playing field in terms of race, uh, uh, gender, uh, whether or not you have, uh, you're physically handicapped or not, is a huge, huge level sort of uh, uh, a setter in, 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 in that sort of a way. And your voting rights are typically via tokens, right? Um, what you vote and uh, your voice uh, in certain platforms are tracked, your activity is tracked so you get promoted. Uh, you know, there are community roles that you can play and you're crowdsourcing ultimately um, and crowd building projects, uh, again, for those that are well governed uh, to further a purpose that you yourself find meaningful, right? So um, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the autonomy that you have over, uh, uh, you know, DAO uh, contributions as, as, from a personal perspective could really mean that the best and the brightest in the world are not only working for a single company in the future, but contributing to multiple DAOs, right? And you can um, therefore earn a living in that way, right? So imagine that, you know, a super bright engineer not working only for us, but working for uh, multiple uh, parties which we welcome uh, because they ultimately are taking their time in terms of rewarding via tokens that they receive from those projects that ended up could be worth a lot or nothing depending on how how uh, how well they contribute and how well that project ultimately is but it's kind of an entrepreneurship isn't it right but you're taking a talent and it becomes a different kind of a career so in, in a lot of ways you're playing to your strengths and you're letting others uh, take other parts that are you know that you might be less interested in, and then uh, and then by the way you can also um, uh, like-minded people can also bond uh, like you can in virtual spaces like uh, within the DAO system or within like a sandbox, um, and uh, there's a, there's really a lot of meaning that you can uh, uh, that you can you can have in terms of uh, participating in, in the DAO. Okay, uh, Evan. Um, while we're on the governance, uh, I've just. I'm in a quarantine hotel, having just returned from uh, the month of August in Europe. And there, every time you open any website, you're reminded of data and privacy. Um, and how are you seeing data and privacy playing out in a Web3 world versus the Web2 world? Well, you know, well, well right now, at least the Web2 world is going to the point of sort of being permission-based. So, you know, uh, you know, if you're on Apple, it's an ask app to track or not to track. You typically wouldn't say, please track me. So at least you have that <laughs> safeguard right now. So Web 2 is coming to the better way of privacy. But Web 3 is permission-based privacy, isn't it, right? So uh, if you are to participate in certain things, like sort of in any mocha, we are very careful about uh, uh, sort of KYC or KYT. Uh, we do need to understand who our customers are. But if you participate in, uh, so it's permission based. If you are to participate in certain things that are valuable, I uh, will make sure that the, uh, you know, the the, the customer or, or our money source is coming from legitimate sources. But uh, other than that, uh, your participation in DAOs and all that is anonymous. So there's no data to be mined. And even when we KYC, we we are not looking at the identity uh, ourselves. We're basically checking out uh, using a third party 
checking out that particular person is legitimate and a real person. And then we don't actually uh, uh, see the data at all. So, so ultimately, um, the, the Web3, again, the social part of, of that, right, Walter, as we talk about having a lot of fun talking about this, is that that part is really important because what, are we, what does the community want? Right? A community doesn't want their data to be mined. They want to have permission based. Uh, they want to contribute their time in a meaningful way. They want to place their own bets on time, shall we say, right? So the permission-based part of it is kind of like you can choose to participate or not. But by nature uh, of Web3, rather than sort of signing up, you know, uh, logging through Google, Google or logging through Facebook, you're logging through your wallet, right? And your wallet is just a number, right? So yes, while that wallet is super transparent, you do not have to disclose who you are. So privacy is actually uh, super good uh, in, in Web3, uh, sometimes too good. We have to actually go back to the other side where you reconnect the real world, when you do real world transactions and with fiat money, sometimes you actually have to go an extra step to make sure the funds are legitimate. Okay, and um, look, the, the example, the, the talk today uh, is about creating a more positive impact. And uh, amongst your portfolio companies, are there any that you'd like to kind of shout out or show examples of ways that that is happening um, uh, today? Yeah, I shout out a bit already, sort of like, you know, uh, I think uh, MetaCarbon, you know, one of them are, are sort of doing things that are very interesting. We actually have uh, Untamed Planet, uh, who is actually, uh, which is a, a major project that we have. It's really, um, uh, 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 you know, is a, a major project that is about, you know, that has uh, conservation elements to it. Um, and uh, and uh, where the green token about to be launched is really about funding different sustainability projects via the, the, the green token. Um, and uh, we also have uh, um, Colossus, which is a, which is a, a, a colossal, not Colossus, but it's really about you know reviving using DNA to revive uh, maybe extinct animals, right? And through that, using NFTs as education to understand you know. The, uh, the the you know the dangers of lack of biodiversity and extinctions uh, of of the of, of uh, various animals in the world. So you know we we can use this as, as education a lot, right? And then there there are some uh, uh, companies we're invested into again. You know, tiny tab we're looking into. Uh, I suppose uh, different education companies as well uh, that could potentially complement the space that you were in, uh, and also in music. Uh, we have various partnerships, we have uh, JVs, we have uh, other partners, uh, hopefully contributing positively to the space. Uh, obviously, Pixel Links is, is one of the uh, companies in, uh, in the music space that we have, uh, we believe will, will do very well. Uh, but uh, I don't want to like, you know, overblow this to be a kind of like, oh, all the Animoca portfolio companies. <laughs> no, 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 great, Evan, right? we've heard, we've heard, it, we've heard. <laughs> Hey, um, I wanted to ask you a question. About 15 years ago, there was real growth in the voluntary carbon markets, and then we hit the Lehman-induced uh, recession, and a lot of that disappeared. Uh, today, we're facing some challenging economic times around the world. Will ESG kind of fade in the background as people prioritize profits again? Uh, you know, How does this balance in the economy as we look forward to some of the challenges ahead? Okay, well, so this is a, this is a less of Web three conversation than the, the, the economics conversation in the markets, right? When you tie the markets to, we when you try to use a market incentive system to uh, to do uh, to time or social good, you always the right market volatility. That I think is the issue. So hot car markets, you know, uh, pricing goes up and down uh, depending on the market and how well the market does, right? But, you know, Walter, the saving grace, right, of that rather than riding with volatility is what is the next generation asking for, right? And again, you look at the children's curriculum, one thing that has, in fact, evolved is that everybody you talk to as a youngsters talk about recycling, the planet, our consciousness. What do you think they want, right? So if you look at the, the region that is the furthest into this, right, uh, which is Europe, right? Um, you can you can see it. Every single element of investing has a. I might be exaggerating, but I just it just feels like that every element of investing has the ESG uh, thought and element into it, right? Asia is probably the first behind. Depends on which Asia uh, that you're talking about, uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, you know uh, North America is obviously getting there, but. Uh, 
if the youngsters uh, continue to have that uh, aspiration, we'll find a better governance model for it. And perhaps, as you're asking, Walter, Web3 can too play a role. Well, Evan, it's great to see that uh, as a leader in Web3, uh, Animoca Brands retains ESG at the forefront of its guiding philosophy. And we really appreciate this opportunity to walk through the portfolio and better understand uh, your work. Um, uh, and uh, thank you so much for this conversation today. Thank you, Walter. Always a pleasure. Great. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, and enjoy Scale Up Impact Summit, and we'll see you online in a bit.